Hey, good morning, folks. Um, uh, my name's Sean, and I'm a little nervous and feel a little pretentious doing this, but uh, I wrote a little short story a couple of days ago that I posted to my Facebook, and um, more than one person asked me if I would record it, and uh, so I'm going to try and record it. I just uh, want everybody who might be listening to know that I love them, and that's really what I want to say in all of this. So, so much love for everybody, and I'm thinking of you all, and I miss all the people I normally spend my day with, and uh, I love you. Anyway, here goes. An electrician, a vape store owner, a pastry chef, a money lender, a retreat center owner, a food server, coffee entrepreneurs, and an artist all walked into a coffee shop. They came from several countries, different upbringings, different religious beliefs, different socioeconomic backgrounds, and spanned a range of ethnicities. They were all connected by this shared love of this magical coffee bean. They drank lattes and pour overs and cold brews. Some put sugar in their coffee, while others among us thought that was sacrilegious. Some of them would eat, some of us would eat cookies or donuts or empanadas while they enjoyed their coffees. Others watched their diet and abstained from eating in the morning. Some rode bikes to the coffee shop. Some walked, some drove cars, and one would regularly arrive to much fanfare on a dune buggy. Nonetheless, they all came together from 7 to 8 a.m. and shared a morning ritual that, ritual that included, among other things, hugs, kisses, elaborate handshakes, and genuine well wishes. They spoke English, Spanish, and sometimes French to each other. Over time, they voluntarily created a community that supported each other. They celebrated each other's joyful moments and they held space for each other in difficult times. If one of them missed the morning coffee ritual, they received a WhatsApp message to see if they were okay. If they didn't respond the next day, they got called and checked up on. They helped each other buy cars, rent apartments, find healthcare, and they recommended restaurants to each other. They shared dietary advice, workout advice, and they suggested destinations local and far to visit. They talked about anything and everything without fear. They cared for each other and they all felt so safe sharing with each other. Others joined or passed through their mornings of community, some with a degree of permanence and some quite transient. They discussed current events. Some believed in conspiracies that others thought were crazy. They discussed how grateful they all were to live in this magical part of the planet. They spoke of their past, their dreams for the future and their hopes and their fears. And frequently, they discussed politics. They often disagreed. They sometimes picked sides based on long-held beliefs that they had trouble letting go of, even when faced with mountains of irrefutable facts showing the sheer folly of their claims. Guilty. Sometimes their disagreements were loud and animated, and sometimes they could fairly be called arguments. But since they were always face-to-face -face without the veil of impersonality often created during online conversations, no grudges or resentments were held, and no judgments were made. They all loved to spend time together in community with other imperfect humans. Quite simply, they all held space for each other selflessly. And then one day, one day they all had to let go. In immediate terms, they had to let go of this morning ritual, this morning ritual. They shared one last cup of coffee together while practicing social distancing. One last lively debate, lively debate. They celebrated Howie's new daughter, Bella, and they mourned the temporary loss of their daily reunion, where they seemingly recounted and solved all of the world's problems each day. They discussed politics one last time, argued about which world leaders were to blame. The conspiracists put forth conspiracies, and they said goodbye for now and then they all went home. Some to their homes here in Costa Rica and some to their homes in other countries. They hadn't fully realized it yet, but they were forced to let go of their political ideologies. They would need to let go of their prejudice, their judgments, their ingrained programming, and everything else they clung to for no reason other than they had always clung to it. Because in this moment, the reality that all the governments of the world had failed set in. From the most restrictive countries in the world to those that restricted freedom the least, all the governments of the world have failed in their most basic promise, their most basic responsibility to keep their citizens safe. For what legitimate role can a government serve if it can't first keep its citizens safe? No dictators, no fascists, no socialists, no democratically elected leaders, not the left, 
the right, or even the moderates were able to protect their citizens from a virus that likely spilled over from a bat or a pangolin into the human population at a wet market in a far off land that none of them had ever traveled to. These so-called leaders with all the power in the world couldn't even protect themselves from the virus, let alone anyone else. Not one government in all the world got it right. Not one government reacted in time to protect their citizens. Not one government properly prepared for a global pandemic, despite so many that had threatened the world before. Not Western governments steeped in Christian ideology, not Middle Eastern governments beholden to Muslim ideals, and not Israel with their Jewish nation state laws. All the praying in the world had not protected them. Not those who pray to one God, not those who pray to all the gods, not those who seemingly worship at the altar of science. The Buddhists, the Hindus, the Sikhs, the Taoists, and the Confucianists had all failed to pray their way out of the path of a virus. Even the yogis with our crystals, essential oils, sage, and healing herbs failed to protect ourselves from a virus that started in one country and has now infected more than 400,000 people in over 160 countries. They weren't protected by their constitutions. In fact, the aforementioned leaders used terms like martial law to suspend the freedoms many thought were guaranteed to them. Their amendments, their Supreme Courts, and all the voting they had done did nothing to protect them. They weren't protected by the ill will they had for those who voted for the other team. The trillions upon trillions of tax dollars governments received did absolutely nothing to stop the spread of a virus that without any intention at all wreaked havoc across the world begging the question of what a virus created with intention could do. In this way, a collective reality emerged that all the military and law enforcement in the world is defenseless against one person in a laboratory. In this way, a collective reality that nothing is in control except our own actions would emerge. Racism, sexism, homophobia, religionism, and every other kind of hate did nothing to save them. The patriarchy did nothing to protect them and in fact likely accelerated the spread of the virus. Those who thought they were part of a master race were forced to sit at home in union with those they had hated for no reason. And so everyone went home. When they went home, they could stay connected. The internet streamed the news of the virus to them and the news was loud. These same failed world leaders told them rights needed to be suspended. They sent the military into the street to keep the people in their homes. They closed the beaches, the parks, the restaurants, and everything they could in their last futile hope of controlling the people. The people collectively held their breath, united in fear, many mourning the reality that they would not be able to hold loved ones for weeks or months, gripped by the fear of not being able to protect those they loved the most. Lovers started to count the days until they would be reunited, a difficult task even nobody knew when that would be. But while they were at home, some wondrous things started to happen. They learned to do more with less. They learned to turn inward. There were no stories of mass shootings. There were no stories of terrorism. There was no news of hate crime. In fact, the only hate crime they read about was the leader of the free world, the four times bankrupt TV show host whose power required hate and divisiveness to flourish, claiming the virus that had sent the entire world home was a Chinese virus. One last desperate attempt to control the population by dividing it but even his most devout, most devout followers had to know he was full of shit. The news of the virus and the empty promises of governments around the world became so redundant that it suddenly turned into background noise. And while the people were at home alone, they came to know that they were home alone in a community. They came to know themselves. It became impossible to gloss over past traumas that were holding them back. Seven billion people collectively faced their fears, healed and turned away from all of their misguided beliefs. Seven billion people stopped believing that others would protect the world while they consumed senselessly. Seven bi billion people forgave each other and most importantly, they forgave themselves. They let go of residual resentment that had crippled them for years and even for lifetimes. They let go of beliefs that were holding them back. They let go of attachments and illusions of control. They let go of the belief that their beliefs were more valid or important than those who disagreed with them. And then while the people were at home, while the planes weren't flying and the boats weren't boating and the cars and trucks weren't being driven and the factories weren't producing items that people had no use for, another amazing thing happened. The world healed. Where the world had been warming, it cooled. Jungles stopped burning and they regenerated. Where species were dying off, they instead multiplied. Instead, everyone was at home in stillness, listening. 
not listening to their fears, not listening to their limiting beliefs, and not listening to shame that had been heaped upon them throughout their lives. They were at home hearing their own hearts and souls. They were at home reconnecting with their most authentic of selves. Since they were separated from loved ones and couldn't avoid emotions by watching TV or whatever other avoidance techniques they typically use together, they called each other and FaceTimed each other, and most importantly, they listened to each other. And they listened to hear instead of to respond. Since they had nothing but time, they were not quick to respond. Sometimes conversations lasted for days. Sometimes answers came hours after questions were asked. They got to know one another, and in this way, they got to know themselves. They learned that we all have different hopes, different fears, different traumas to heal. And as they learned of all the ways we are different, they learned that we are more the same than we ever imagined. People who hated each other had to give up the hate because they were locked in a communal act of self-defense against a common enemy. They learned that the way to win any battle is to surrender. They learned that surrender and letting go are not the same as giving up. And they learned that attachment is not the same as commitment. And as they listened to each other, leaders emerged. Not elected leaders, not those born into power, not those who use money and privilege to buy their way into power, and especially not those who use violence to rule others. The true leaders, those who lead with their words and actions, those who, excuse me, those who people voluntarily choose to follow and to hear. Yeah. Those who lead by example and by uniting people instead of those who lead through division and fear. Those who encourage others to hear them critically. Leaders who aren't afraid to have their beliefs challenged. Leaders who are open and transparent, not those who would have people follow them blindly. And then one day, one glorious day through their commitment to each other, through their commitment to being alone together, a shared wisdom emerged. And with amazing grace, the virus started to subside. By staying home and surrendering, they had starved away a virus that threatened all of us. They won a war against an enemy that had by then infected millions in all of the countries of the world simply by staying home and listening. Where there had been thousands of new cases, there were only hundreds. And then one day came where there were no new cases of the virus. And still the people stayed home. They did less, they felt more, and they continued to protect each other by needing less. They simply let go. Seven billion people decided to collectively care for each other, to recognize each other, to honor each other, to love each other, and to hold space for each other. Seven billion people allowed the world to heal both physically and figuratively. The families that were separated still missed each other. The lovers who were separated still hoped to be in each other's arms, to reunite with a half of their heart they hadn't held in weeks or months. But they were all present and secure in the belief that when the time was right, they would be reunited. They accept the reality in front of them. They took the time to listen, to heal old wounds, and they learned to give and receive the love they needed. They learned to love each other selflessly and without expectation. They challenged each other to heal and they healed. They listened to each other and they listened to themselves. They prayed for each other. They became less and less attached to each other as they became more and more committed to each other. There was happiness and sadness even in the silence, even as they stayed home. Babies were born, people passed away, children passed milestones, birthdays were had. At home, as they became more silent, as they turned further inward and knew themselves better, the world started to come to them. The air smelled better. There were more birds chirping, more dogs barking, more plants and trees growing, and more hope in the air. As they stood in their doorways, the sun on their face in ways they had never noticed, they enjoyed their lawns in a natural state. Having surrendered the need to spread chemicals, pull dandelions from the ground to mow, and most importantly, the need to spend hours away from their family competing with their neighbors to have the greenest, most perfectly manicured lawns. At home, they stopped comparing their bodies to the bodies of others. They stopped trying to make themselves more physically attractive to those around them, and instead they became more emotionally attractive. They became themselves in all of their glory. Their hearts, minds, and spirits became so tangible that the physical body became almost invisible. Ironically, as they ate less processed food and ate more vegetables, as they stopped judging others or themselves on the physical body, the people became more physically healthy and beautiful than ever. They learned to believe in themselves and to love themselves. 
As they all gave each other the gift of staying home, they learned that giving truly is a greater joy than receiving. They learned that they couldn't hold their breath forever, so they learned to breathe. They learned that you're never truly alone if you are with your authentic self. And then one day, one graceful day, the virus was gone. And not just the virus that had sent them home, the virus of mass hate was gone, the virus of divisiveness was gone, the virus of low self-esteem was gone, the virus of consumerism was gone, the virus of comparison was gone, the virus of judgment was gone, and the virus of shame was gone. They learned that one bad apple can't spoil the pie for the rest of us unless we give that one bad apple invisible powers, unless we let it cast spells. And still nobody raced to go out, They protected in each other and they protected themselves by waiting. They chose not to do anything that might cloud the connections they made while they were alone. They chose not to let anyone into their world who might interfere with the connection to true self and to the self-love that had emerged. They continued to listen without judgment. They abandoned the failed leaders. They chose to follow the true leaders who didn't need to rule, who didn't crave power and didn't tell them what to do. They chose to protect the planet and the rest of the creatures by not rushing the planes back into the sky. And when they did start going back out into the world, they did so deliberately and with intention. They thought about their actions. They didn't put others or the planet at risk. Most importantly, they didn't let anyone's beliefs keep them from being their true selves. When they did come outside, They did so with love. When they interacted with others, they did so from a place of mutual understanding. When they did travel back to friends, family, and lovers, they took nothing for granted. They chose to visit those who had supported their growth while they were alone. When the families held each other, they felt every bit of contact. They came to know each other in ways they'd never known each other. They laid down in the grass or the sand. They swam in the ocean. They hiked. They gathered fresh foods. They gazed at the sun, and they moved slowly. They didn't rush about and they didn't yearn for that which others had and they did not. They stayed present. They enjoyed each moment without worrying about the past or planning for the future. When the lovers reunited, they didn't make love with reckless abandon. They loved each other with intention. They connected in ways they'd never dreamed of. They held each other and came to know each other so deeply and so intimately that they could speak without words. They came to know what every movement the other made meant. They learned to care for each other and to love each other authentically and by choice. They spent hours gazing into each other's eyes, drinking in everything about each other, taking time to learn what every gaze meant. They came to hold space for each other in ways they had never dreamed of. They didn't go to bed angry. They didn't hold grudges or transfer personal poison back and forth. They committed to themselves and each other and loved each other like every moment might be their last. They allowed for each other to be heard without fear or without judgment. Their hearts united like they were one heart. Their twin flames burned brighter than ever and they loved each other with all that they were. And the people formed new communities and systems that were inclusive. They valued everyone in the community's input from day one. They created diverse alliances that allowed them to provide for each other. As new generations of children were born with intention instead of by accident, The communities educated them. They were born into love. They were encouraged and they were held. They were appreciated and they were kept safe. They grew up never having to adapt to trauma, to create a false self, to wear a mask, or to feel unsafe being themselves. They didn't grow up in need to heal because they had never been traumatized or programmed in the first place. They were encouraged to be authentic in every moment of their lives. They were able to face every moment, every emotion, the good, the bad, the happy and the sad, knowing they had all the support they needed in their community. And they knew themselves well enough to face anything that came their way. And somewhere along the way, everyone was united at the coffee shop. They shared hugs, kisses, and elaborate handshakes. They felt each other physically and spiritually. They celebrated the new day and the new world that had emerged. They cherished the magical being. They all drank their coffee in different ways and enjoyed it with different foods. They all held space for each other. They all felt safe. They laughed and listened and engaged in lively debates. But politics was never again the discourse of the day. They let go of everything and they were present with each other. Each day they lived in love, in their natural state, as their true selves. Namaste. I love you. I love you. I love you to the moon and back.
I love you. To the moon and back, and to the moon and back, and to the moon and back. Hey, Amo, thank you for listening, and um, I'm so grateful that people asked me to do this, and I hope somebody out there in the world will see it and enjoy it, and if not, I love you anyway. Thank you so much. Be well. <laughs>